end stage renal disease with uh, dialysis dependence. And further studies show that uh, more than 50% uh, of patients with end stage renal disease die from cardiovascular disease. And the risk is 30 more times in patients who are receiving dialysis. So, uh, this lipidemia with uh, resultant atherosclerosis in patients with CKD is associated with uh, ischemic uh, heart disease and cerebrovascular accident, which predispose these patients to recurrent heart attacks and stroke. So this may contribute to the high burden of death, which is caused by cardiovascular disease uh, from these CKD patients. So uh, our problem was that uh, if the prevalence of this lipidemia in general population is 25%, but these prevalences is even higher, ranging for 48% in stage one and two, to 8% in stage 3, 4, and 5. So this shows that at the stage of CKD increases, uh, the prevalence of this lipidemia increases. And studies show that uh, CKD stages, but also the uh, degree of proteinuria, are one of the factors that may be contributing to the increase in prevalence of uh, this lipidemia among CKD patients. So treatment with statin and desert, I mean, uh, I've been shown not to reduce the risk of major atherosclerotic events which are identified by myocardial infarction, but will also delay the progression of CKD. So uh, it is recommended that a patient, if they are started early, prophylaxis with uh, statin or ezetimib, they can be, uh, we can reduce the risk of uh, dyslipidemia, but also decrease the progression of uh, the CKD disease itself. So what we did, we did a cross-sectional study at Bugando Medical Center. It was a retrospective. Uh, among the patients who are attending at the dialysis unit between January and September 2022. And we recovered our data from the electronic health management system. So uh, CKD was defined by KIDGO, and lipid abnormality was defined as total cholesterol greater than 5.2, HDL less than 5.3, and LDL was greater than 3.4. Triglyceride was defined as greater than 1.69. So what we've, this is what we found. Uh, we had a total of 100 patients in our study who meet the eligibility criteria in this study. And uh, the mean age was 60, and majority of participants were male. That is 76% of them. So uh, on comorbidity, 62% uh, of the patient had hypertensive-related cardiac disease. That is hypertension and hypertensive uh, heart disease. While 13% had DM and 29 of the patient had any diagnosed the comorbid at the time of data collection of this study. So this is what we found. The prevalence of this epidemia was uh, very high, 91%, very high comparing to any other study that was done uh, in Africa. And the high uh, density lipoprotein, that is HDL, was uh, contributing to majority of this uh, dyslipidemia, as 90% of our patient had uh, uh, the HDL below the normal range. Uh, triglyceride was elevated below range in 12% of the patient, while 9% uh, of the patient had uh, uh, elevated LDL, while 8% has uh, elevated the total cholesterol. So this is a graphical pre uh, presentation which show uh, various uh, parameters of the lipid profile. The first one is LDL, uh, that is 9% of the patient has elevated. HDL, 90%. Uh, total, uh, I mean, triglyceride 8 and total cholesterol uh, 12%. So on the pattern of uh, this lipidemia, what we found is that uh, they re use the uh, HDL only was the most common pattern of this lipidemia among the CKD patient on dialysis. And that it was uh, contributing for 67% of the all pattern that we looked for. Followed by the other pattern was a uh, combination of uh, reduced the HDL and elevated the triglyceride, which contributed to 13%. Other patterns such as low HDL, high LDL, low HDL, uh, high TG, high total cholesterol, and others, they contributed to 6.7% of the pattern of this lipidemia. So on the predictors of, of this lipidemia, uh, we had three predictors in our study. That was sex age and this lipidemia and uh, comorbidity, but age and sex did not show any statistical significance. 
we found a relationship between comorbidity and uh, this lipidemia in that patients who had hypertensive heart disease, patients who had uh, diabetes mellitus, and patients who had hypertension were uh, uh, li more likely to have uh, this lipidemia compared to those who have no any other diagnosed comorbidity. So this was uh, what we found in our study. But we've, uh, we had several uh, limitations in our study. One of which is that uh, we had a very small sample size. So uh, we are recommending a large study which may include further patient and following this patient when they are in uh, early stages from stage one up to stage five so that we can see the real picture of the ADC lipidemia. But also we, uh, we recommend a study which may uh, help evaluate this patient pre and post dialysis so that we can know where we can uh, alter the this lipidemia in starting the statin therapy. So our conclusion was that this lipidemia is very prevalent among CKD patients who are in hemodialysis with significant reduced the HDL and the elevated LDL and total cholesterol. So uh, having comorbidity, that is having hypertension and DM, because having hypertension and DM has been shown now that a patient who having hypertension or a patient who have DM, apart from having CKD, they have a high level of uh, they have this lipidemia. I was leading one study by Chatanda in Tanzania et al. that was done among uh, DM patients. It showed that 95% of DM patients had this lipidemia. So that showed that if a patient has DM and chronic kidney disease, so the risk is more. If a patient has DM or has hypertension and chronic kidney disease, the risk is more. So if we can act on this patient in early stages, we can uh, reduce the risk of uh, this lipidemia and death which are caused by cardiovascular mortality. So study, our study was recommended regular monitoring of blood lipids among CKD patients. We also recommend early prophylaxis treatment of lipid lowering drug of CKD patient. On dialysis, but also if further study are done from the early stages, we can start this treatment on the first stage of CKD before they progress to uh, uh, end stage renal disease and up, end up with uh, cardiovascular uh, disease which are come from this lipidemia. So thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Kaiser, for this uh, uh, enlightening presentation. Uh, I wonder if uh, uh, Neema Kailembo is around. So well, now we'll go. We'll, we'll uh, look at the presentation from uh, James uh, Crispin, uh, which uh, we skipped initially. Your name, Okay. So may I? I would like to welcome Neema so that she can give a talk, and then we will do the uh, recorded presentation later. And Neema is going to talk to us about coronary artery disease management in Tanzania, a clustering approach to tailored care and intervention. Good morning. Um, Neema Kailembo, a research scientist from Jakarta Kote Cardiac Institute, but also a member of um, the CAT. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Can you hear me now? Sorry. So I'm Neema Kailembo, a research scientist from Jakarta Kote Cardiac Institute, but a member of uh, data science and mathematical modeling team at Ifekara Health Institute. So I'm here to present the preliminary results on coronary artery disease management in Tanzania, uh, a clustering approach to tailored care and intervention. Um, so the epidemiology of, of coronary artery disease in sub-Saharan Africa is still a mystery, 
that includes um, Tanzania. And as you can see on the map, countries that have colors are those that have reported the prevalence of coronary artery disease. And as you can see in Africa, nothing has been reported. But this map was produced in 2017 by Chan. Recently, South Africa and Egypt have reported the prevalence. So the map will be updated, but so far no map has been produced on coronary artery disease. So this is caused by positive data. We don't have reliable data that can help us establish the prevalence of coronary artery disease. And again, we don't have the diagnostic capability. So far, as you all know, in Tanzania, we only have five catheterization laboratories and three are from uh, public institutions. That two in, are in JKCI, one at Benjamin Mkapa Hospital, two are in private hospitals, one at Sefi, the other one at Aga Khan Hospital. And again, we have few cardiologists. As you all are aware, uh, we, all, we have almost uh, less than 50 cardiologists in Tanzania, and most of them are at JKCI. Few of them are located in regional hospitals. So this also hinders early detection and management of these patients. Sorry. So the most affected uh, societies are those that are under, uh, underprivileged, the poor people, and those who can't access health services. So they normally present at the hospital late, and the outcome of them is unfavorable. And this is not only on patients, but also on the hospital, because it increases the management cost in terms of the consumable used and the money power that will be allocated to them. So what does the literature say? So we, the literature have established that uh, risk factor of NCDs are uh, influenced by lifestyle and um, urbanization. And this has been also done or approved on our recent um, paper that has been published by Dr. Pedro Parangio, where we evaluated the prevalence of risk factors. And we found out that the prevalence of risk factor is larger than what we have expect expected. And most people are not aware of the risk factors. And some of them were presented with double burden of two risk factors or more. And from this study also, we have uh, established that uh, risk factor tend to cluster according to age or gender. And as all aware that um, lifestyle in Tanzania is different because uh, re re regions in Tanzania have different tradition and culture that influence these lifestyles differently. So we expect, a, we expect this risk factor to differ. And I've provided you with an example of a 28-year-old male who had myocardial infraction due to energy drink. So this is an interesting uh, diverse of lifestyle that can influence risk factors and hence cardiovascular diseases. Again, we did another study on hypertension, on medication adherence and blood, con blood pressure control. And in this study, we found out that secondary prevention is not enough. Emphasis on behavior change is important. So this shows you how important it is to tackle the risk factors through lifestyle and lifestyle and uh, through lifestyle. Let me, let me end it there. So from this, we decided to uh, group these risk factors by identifying the symptoms and risk factor, put them into groups, and evaluate what tailored intervention would be appropriate to these groups. So uh, we used retrospective data. The KCI started doing procedure in 2013, but we used data from 2015 to 2023. But what I'm going to present today is from 2015 to 2018, as this is an ongoing study. Uh, we evaluated patient uh, reports and notes. And again, the patient were um, termed as, as they had coronary artery disease if the lesion was larger than 50%. And we analyzed the demographics. Clustering analysis was done through K-prototype algorithm. It's a machine learning algorithm. Um, so on our result, what have you found out? First of all, 61% of our uh, patients were male, and 55% were above 60 years old. <coughs> Women were found to be more obese than men. Same with uh, the level of cholesterol. Women had higher level of cholesterol than men. 
So uh, we did an overall, uh, uh, overall evaluation of symptoms and risk factors, and um, chest pain was the most significant uh, risk factor, uh, sorry, symptom, and age, hypertension, diabetic, prior MI, and prior PCI were significant risk factors. This is an overall before we did crystalline. So we did crystalline. We had four groups. The first group, 79% female patients. 53 of these patients were above 60 years old. The prevalence in this group was 37%. And diving deeper into this group, you can see we have uh, compared uh, two groups between uh, those who had coronary artery disease and those that were normal on this particular cluster. And this near was the prominent uh, symptoms, symptom, but the risk factor in this group were diabetic, prior MI, and prior PCI. Once we evaluate this risk factor, you can go back to the demographics that I've already presented, uh, where I said that obese and uh, Croatia were the prominent um, uh, factors in female population. And this cluster had a lot of females. Um, the second cluster, sorry, this didn't go back. The second cluster had um, more male, like 80%, age between 40 and 60, and the prevalence in this group was 44%. And diving deeper into their symptoms and risk factor, you can see that most of them suffered from chest pain. And diabetic, prior MI, prior VCI, gender, and this epidemia was a prominent risk factor in this, in this second cluster. The third cluster had 80% uh, of male also, but their age started from 24 to 6 years old. Prevalence was 51%. And if you, if you compare between cluster 2 and 3, you feel like they're a bit similar, but they're not. Because uh, on this group, all four symptoms were significant. And apart from uh, diabetic and prior MI, smoking was significant on this group. And this was the group that had the worst outcome, as most mortality came from this group. And they had higher risk of triple vessel disease as compared to the other group, which had uh, a risk of double vessel disease. So it means smoking had uh, increased the, the risk in this particular group. Uh, the fourth group, this group composed of elderly people by 90%, and the prevalence in this group was 61%. And chest pain was a significant symptom, but as you can see, the risk factor were also diabetic, prior MI, prior PCI, and dyslipidemia. So what are we learning from this? Uh, first of all, also this group had uh, a high chance of having triple vessel disease because of age also. So what we learned from our result is that, apart from having uh, older people, we have a significant number of premature coronary lateral disease, patients who are below 45 years old, so by 12.5%. This is alarming and calls for an intervention, and we suggested that intervention targeting youth and women should focus on reducing unhealth diet, emphasizing on physical activity, uh, making campaigns on smoking and alcohol abuse so that people will understand the importance of have, living a, a, a health lifestyle. So this can be the same to elderly patients, but we have added proper patient management on, and on elderly patients because as you have seen on our results, we have recurrence of prior MI, prior PCI, p patients who are coming back with listenosis. So we suggest that proper patient management is very important. So we are not sure yet where uh, these prior MI and prior PCI are coming from because it can be a fault of JKCI or a fault of other hospitals because once we, done, once we are done with the intervention, we send the patients back to, their, to other hospitals. So we are not sure how those hospitals are managing these patients. So uh, our way forward on these uh, patient management is to map out where these prior MI and prior PCI are coming from so that we'll be able to tailor training to, uh, to doctors in other regions on how to manage patients 
who are coming from interventions so that we can reduce this problem. And again, um, counseling, this is basically for JKCI, because if you counsel patients properly, they will understand the importance of behavior changes and how, uh, the importance of medication adherence. So they won't stop this medication and they will adhere to lifestyle changes. Um, our way forward also is uh, to use this clustering, uh, this cluster to make a tool that will use artificial intelligence to help us with early detection. As you have seen that we only have five catheterization laboratories, so it means we need a tool that can help us uh, with early detection. And this tool will be tested on JKCI outreach program that is ongoing. Um, and the last one is on the mapping, and I hope um, everybody will be able to participate on this one. Um, thank you. So I would like to appreciate the supervisors, uh, Dr. Kiwale, Kisenge, Dr. Pedro, and Dr. Masabo, JKCI team, and IHI team. Thank you for listening. Thank you, thank you, uh, Ms. Nema Kailembo for that uh, enlightening talk. And I think now we have uh, Dr. Stephanie Krauth, who is online, and she would like to give, uh, to give this presentation now. Um, sure, indeed it is. Please, you can start your presentation. Yes, we can. Please go on. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. Uh, I would like to thank you for the talk from the Centre of the Health and Fire and Food and Health and Fire and the Center of the Health and Fire and the Center of the Health and Fire and the Center of the Health and Fire. So the total project is looked at one of the centers 
between people who had non-muscular skeletal abnormalities and who had muscular skeletal abnormalities, which is what we'd hopefully expect in a muscular skeletal disability scale. Um, but this difference was driven mostly by two of the domains. So this score has four different domains. One is physical functioning, one is the, the mental health and well-being, and then there is two scores. One is a self-rated um, pain scale, uh, and the other one it was a question um, when uh, we asked people to score from one to ten how well they, they felt in relation to everything that concerns their health and well-being. And those last two domains were the ones that drive the difference between the non-muscular skeletal and the muscular skeletal um, problems in terms of disability. Um, we saw differences in how um, things were related between sexes. So for men, we see with increasing age, uh, the disability scores um, in both the musculoskeletal one and the general one tend to go down as people are older. And I'll try and quickly discuss this at the end of why this could be. But for but for women, we see that as they get older, the scores generally become higher. So overall, mu having musculoskeletal problems had higher scores, but for all of the groups, there was an increase um, of age, except for the, for the who does in women, where the increase was only seen if people had musculoskeletal or other abnormalities. We also saw that um, the role that certain people have in the household affects how much higher they score their disability if they have muscular skeletal problems. So you see in light gray here, uh, for people without muscular skeletal um, disorders, the scores are relatively on the same level, quite low. There's other factors, of course, that can give you some sort of disability. But as soon as people have muscular skeletal disorder, how they rate their disability depends also on their role in the household where adult relatives have higher scores than head of household and spouses, for example. And we see a similar trend uh, related to marital status, where depending on your marital status, once you have musculoskeletal uh, problems, if you're single or widowed, for example, the scores are much higher compared to married or um, just separated. Now, obviously, this is a very complex um, situation where a lot of factors are influencing how you feel in, in terms of disability. And we have done a qualitative research study uh, on this to figure out the exact reasons for this. Um, we can only speculate at this point, but I would say we all know that um, your role in the household, for example, how responsible you are to bring in the income and to help around the house and how much support you have from your family versus if you live far away from them and you're staying with an uncle, you might feel less supported and you might feel more disabled. So all of these factors can play an important role in this. Um, so concluding thought, uh, we have about um, six to eight percent of participants with musculoskeletal uh, disorders and musculoskeletal disorders cause important disability. The impact uh, depends on age and gender, role in the household, and marital status. There were other factors also associated with it, but I have not discussed them in detail. But we can say that the strong association of musculoskeletal disorders with disability highlights that it is important for us to tackle these disorders to improve the health and well-being of people living with these conditions in Tanzania. And with that, I thank you all very much for listening to me, and I can take any questions at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie, for that talk. Thank you very much. So I think we have our last uh, presenter for today was James Crispin. He has given a pre-recorded uh, presentation, but he's going to be online to answer the questions. So let me uh, look for his um, uh, talk, and then uh, we can start it.
please uh, start uh, to present we will help you with the slides okay um hello everyone i really hope you can all hear me well yes we can I'm thank you please go on i'm sorry for I'm sorry for the technical error which has just happened. I am James Crispin, a medical graduate from Catholic University of Health and Allied Science, and I'll be happy to present to you the study which was done in northern west part of Tanzania to determine the prevalence, pattern, and predictor of cardiovascular disease in patients who were attending clinic at CTC Center and admitted in patient at Bugando. Um, we have seen that HIV is among the ancient disease in our country. And the burden of HIV is still going on, despite the intervention which has been done. And we have only witnessed the, how the communities have been affected, and socially, and the quality of life in general. HIV has accounted to over 39 million deaths worldwide, and Sub-Saharan Africa has accounted for more than 70% of global HIV burden. We can see that this is the, is the, it's, it's, it's the most affected so by saying so, it means HIV is affecting rigidly disproportionately. Sub-Saharan Africa and developing countries have, have experienced more effect of HIV. While here in Tanzania, a estimated total of 1.7 million people were living with HIV in the year 2019. Worldwide, it is estimated 17.9 million people died from cardiovascular diseases in 2015. And we are still mm -hmm. experiencing um, epidemiological transition from infectious disease to non-communicable diseases. And the burden of non-communicable diseases is increasing, is increasing progressively. While people who are living with HIV are at 1.5 to 2 times more likely to develop cardiovascular diseases compared to non-infected uh, individuals. So this is a call to action to conduct some of the targeted programs so that we can really protect these people from developing cardiovascular diseases. So um, the objective of uh, the study was to determine the prevalence and the distribution of cardiovascular diseases in people living with HIV who are attending in clinic and admitted at Bugando Medical Center. And another objective was to assess the predictors of cardiovascular diseases in people living with HIV attending clinic and admitted at Bugando Medical Center. On the study methodology, um, it was a hospital-based cross-sectional study which was conducted um, this year, early January, and at, it was conducted at Bugando Medical Center involving both inpatient and outpatients. A simple random sampling technique was used to recruit 203 participants, and the study population were adult HIV-infected patients above 18 years who were attending CTC clinic and admitted at Bugando Medical Center during the study period. The data was collected using pretested WTO stepwise and structured questionnaire. Physical measurement involved information related to anthropometric indices of weight, height, albino circumference, and body pressure were measured. These were all the predictors of cardiovascular complications. So from the study, the majority of the study participants were we are female, and we had a female to male ratio of three ratio one. And the median age of the study participant was 47 years of age, and the younger was 19 years, and the oldest was 83 years of age. We did a behavioral assessment, as we can all see from the graph. If you can observe the, the provided line graph clearly, you can see that we had a serious um, use of alcohol on the majority of the, more than half of the participants were alcohol drinking. And involvement in fitness and sports activities, only few, about 5.4% 4, 4 were involved in fitness and sports activity. While we can clearly visualize, we have a good number of smokers who are um, smoke currently and who are 
we are former smoker. So it's a, it's a, it's a call to action because these, um, these uh, risk factors add effect or uh, predispose these people from developing um, cardiovascular disease. So it's a call to action and interventions need to be addressed. So um, in front, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a tabulation of the clinical data of the study participants. So among those who had history of hypertension, you can see more than 66.7 were in irregular medication. So a lot of people who are hypertensive, they are not really using their medication regularly as advised by the clinicians. And there's a proportion of them, which is 15.7, who were visiting traditional healers for hypertension. It's a, it's a, it's, 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 it's a gap in, in, in which need to be addressed because it's really affecting um, the interventions and predisposes people to develop complications which are related to uh, hypertension. From the study population, um, we had a prevalence, I, I, I think you can all visualize, we had a prevalence of 4.9 of uh, cardiovascular disease among the people who were living with HIV. Yeah, next slide, please. And the provided graph, it's a distribution of uh, cardiovascular diseases and majority of people who are living with HIV were having stroke and hypertensive heart disease. While we still have people who are having heart failure and coronary artery diseases. So we had uh, anthropometric measurement where we were able to measure the body mass index of the study population. And we can still see there is a significant um, number of people who are overweight and obese. And we know that people who are having HIV and again having addition of this and additional risk factors such as overweight and obesity really make them to be more predisposed to develop cardiovascular and complications. So we need to address uh, the community and we need to retarget the program so that we can really, um, really focus on insisting on reducing the body weight and having a normal body mass index. So um, on the physical measurement, we, we measured the blood pressure of the study participants and we had a prevalence of systolic uh, hypertension of 11.8, uh, as you can all see from the, from the, from the presentation. I think you can go to the next slide. Next slide again. So um, the previous slides were, were the associations of which we had from the study population and um, risk factors such as body mass index and alcohol drinking and a sort of hypertension were connected with the development of cardiovascular mm -hmm. diseases. So um, I think um, these points are already been spoken. Maybe you can go to the next slide. Yeah, next slide again. Okay, thank you. So um, I want to conclude by saying that from the study, we have seen that stroke and hypertensive heart disease were the leading cardiovascular disease in people who are living with HIV. And, and hypertension, alcohol consumption, obesity were the risk factor for development of uh, cardiovascular diseases. So I recommend um, we should do more integrated non-communicable diseases in HIV care to community and emphasizing more on community screening and, and awareness programs. And also, we is a call to multidisciplinary approach so that to put partners and collaborators, all of them, so that they can all address HIV and non-communicable diseases um, together. And we are still lacking data concerning on the modality of where, where if we should um, include non-communicable disease service in the pre-existing pre HIV, because we know there are a lot of HIV program which are going on. So it's a call to action. I think it's a call to conduct more clinical trial to see the effectiveness and efficacy of including non-communicable disease services in a pre-existing HIV um, services here in Tanzania. And thank you very much and yeah. Asante, thank you very much, uh, James, uh, for that talk.
and I think you guys are going to be online. So may I really ask you guys, if participants, if they have questions? I think we, uh, we have been able to spare some 10 minutes for questions from all the presenters. I know that the first presenter had already uh, responded to the questions that were directed to him. Asante Nikaribuni. Yes, so we have the first questions. I'll take two rounds. So any questions? Thank you, presenters. And as uh, a epidemiologist, I think I'm more interested with the methodology, the analysis part, and the and the and the result part. So for all the pre the presenters, I didn't see the how the the analysis go, how they did the analysis. So I just want to to know the analysis model for everyone for all the presenters, especially the the presenters from the presenter, the presentation from Kaiser, because it was um, it was um, a study based uh, a hospital based study. So I just want to know the analysis part, the reference group, and the limitation because I I, I just seen there there was a small sample size. So I just want to know the limitation, the reference group, and how you did the, anal the analysis. Have no question to Nema because she just said it was, she presented the preliminary results, so have no question, but my question goes to Kaiser. Yes, so there's a question for Kaiser yes. about the methods that they used and how they... Not the methods, the analysis. The analysis. All right, thank you. Yes. So I think uh, we will ask Kaiser to respond to that. Do you have any other questions? Yes, we have some hand over there. Thank you very much. I have two questions. Actually, it's one question of two parts. The first one was, I wish to direct to the second presenter who presented the study from Ostobes Bugando. Uh, we seen, she, he showed us that there was a prevalence of for CKD more among male than women, but he didn't tell us for the grounds or any factor attributed to it. The second concern was on the recommendation that we should check for uh, this epidemia to patient with early stage of CKD, I think we should change the our vision or our strategy to check for every patient with the risk of CKD. Because when we check at the early stage, it will be too late to determine and intervene. For example, patient with hypertension, even if they don't have CKD, has to be checked for this epidemia and patient with diabetics and all other risk factors. I think that will produce a good result and uh, outcome and improve our care for the patients ending up with KD. Thank you. Asante Sana. Yes, uh, we have three hands here. And I think after these three questions, we will let the presenter respond to them and then we could take another round. Uh, I'm, I'm Dr. Saif Musa from Songea Referral Hospital, and uh, my question was on topic presented by Dr. Kajagi, uh, this epidemia patterns with CKD, and uh, I'm more about uh, recommendations on when to start treatment. Do we wait until uh, LDL or HDL, they have disparities, or we, we have to start some sort of uh, prophylaxis from high risk, and also which medications exactly? Because we have seen more than 90% of patients, they presented with low HDL, of which most of statins, they are not 
good in uh, in increasing the level of HDL. Asante, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Kaiser. Uh, I think I'll have just a simple question. Were there pattern changes in uh, uh, in patients who were on statins, and or were the patients who had statins also included or excluded from your study? Thank you so much. And thank you. There's one hand behind you. That will be the last for this round, and then we will ask the presenters to respond. Karibu, Dr. Okay, thank you. My name is Barak Amsim. Um, first of all, uh, congratulations to the, all the presenters for the good work that you have done. But my question goes to Kaiza. <laughs> you have a good uh, uh, work that you did and uh, provided that you had uh, a very high prevalence of uh, uh, this epidemic among CKD patients. What do you think would be the reason, apart from that you had a very small sample size, do you have any other reason that could be, be contributing to this high prevalence? Thank you. Asante, um, so can we uh, start uh, responding to the questions? And I think most of them were going to Kaiza, is it? Yes, this must have been a very popular presentation. Karib Kaiza. Ah, so thank you very much for the questions. Uh, I have many questions. This show, uh, my study was very interesting. Uh, the first question was on uh, analysis that we used. So uh, we included a patient from a uh, uh, dialysis unit, and uh, there were 100 patients. So data we are evaluated based on um, uh, I mean percentage and uh, and graphs, but predictors we did uh, uh, chi square, and then uh, we did the regression analysis to find the the predictors that we uh, uh, show a significant association. Uh, the other question was on the prevalence of uh, CKD in men, according to study that has. I have uh, passed through men is 10.6% uh, while in women is even higher. Uh, it was 12.5%. Uh, I had another comment on recommendation. I think the questions uh, might be the same on uh, when to start the, uh, this patient on lipid lowering drugs. So, uh, as, as Dr. said there, uh, these patients uh, who are on hemodialysis, as our study uh, showed, they have higher prevalence of this lipidemia, and I reported 91%. But other studies show that uh, this process of this lipidemia starts uh, early in the course of CKD, uh, not when these patients come with the end stage renal disease. So I think if we start these patients early, and as doctor said, not only patient, if uh, the patient develops CKD, uh, because as we know, most patients with DM and hypertension are more likely to develop CKD. And as we saw that these are the risk factor of developing this epidemic. So I think uh, we can start uh, treating this patient, giving early prophylaxis for all patients who have risk of having this epidemia. And for my uh, study that was done among CKD patients, I think also this CKD patient on early stage when they are diagnosed, they should be started on early prophylaxis. I know our health system is changing, but I think it will be also better to screen everybody in our country. Uh, the entire population, when they come to the hospital, they should uh, be screened for lipid abnormalities. So this will help to reduce the, uh, uh, the risk of this lipidemia, rather than uh, waiting for this patient to come to the hospital with diabetes mellitus, with hypertension, with CKD, where there is an increased risk of this disease. So the other question was on um, the statins. So, so 
as for my knowledge up to now, uh, there are various recommendations. Uh, I was passing through Kidgo, they recommended the use of statin in combination with uh, Ezemetib and other drugs such as um, they call PCK9. Uh, but our guideline did not recommend it, uh, the use of any of those drugs. But other guidelines, they, um, they recommend the use of both of the drug. And uh, it has been shown that uh, use of more than one drug is, uh, is proven to be more efficacious than using a single drug in treatment of uh, dyslipidemia among these patients. High preference was 91. Why? So, um, most literature show uh, there is uh, alteration in the metabolism transport of uh, lipid among the CKD patients. And uh, this depends on uh, decreased urinary clearance, alteration of enzyme uh, such as uh, cholinesterase transfer protein, but also some studies show that also nutrition among patients with CKD can be a contributing factor to the high prevalence of dyslipidemia among these patients. So for us, as we evaluated the only pattern, we didn't go uh, deeper to evaluate the, what might be the cause of uh, high prevalence of uh, dyslipidemia, but based on other studies that have been done, the pathophysiology and the alteration of uh, lipid abnormalities plus nutrition have been an essential for the uh, increase in prevalence of dyslipidemia. But also the type of uh, dialysis that these patients undergo. Studies show that uh, the use of dialyzer membrane has been also contributed to the rise of this uh, lipid abnormality. So I think I've responded to the question. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Kaiser, for that uh, uh, response. And uh, yes, uh, I, may I seek attention from your participants? Uh, if your car is uh, registered uh, with number T eight one seven D R A, can you go to your car? Uh, you are urgently needed there, Asante. T eight one seven D R A. Well, so uh, since we have uh, Neymar here with us, I'm just asking her what w she has given us a talk about the m uh, management of coronary artery disease. And I know that the burden is getting bigger. And um, so I just want to know what does she think will be the best way of reducing the burden of coronary artery disease in Tanzania? And uh, given the fact that we have very few centers that are giving this treatment at the moment. Thank you. Thank you for an enlightening question. Um, I think uh, the best way is to tackle hypertension because as I presented, 91% of our patients were hypertensive. And I intentionally added the literature review on um, hypertension patients and, uh, the, and blood pressure control in a sense that um, secondary prevention is not enough. So we need to go back to primary prevention. So even if you are managing hypertensive patients, we feel that they are due to medication, but again, we need to control them on behavioral uh, changes. We to give us a, a good result on uh, blood pressure control, and then we can um, reduce the burden of coronary artery disease. But for those that are coming with thrombosis, I think the focus on primary prevention, prevention. That is the that changes. changes. So maybe, so maybe we have, we have two, two questions. questions. Karibu. Karibu. Two, two, last two last questions. questions. So can so you start, can we start with that one? one? And I'm happy that I've never, never thought, thought that's the best way, 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 way of treating these patients, patients is not to have labs. 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 We should, we should probably, probably invest more, more in making sure people don't get their medications and they don't get their own space. So thank you for that. I know we are over there fighting for having other labs everywhere in the country. That might not be the best way of doing it. Karibu. Karibu. Thank you. Thank you. 
my question, my question there to them. Them. Thank, you, thank you for your, your presentation. presentation. My, my question is about, about the behavior of your change. But current career was young, 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 I want to know, did you ever try to check and study about the risk and how you're going to advise the community? Because if you go around everybody working with the energy, energy and the, I, actually most of them, they are not following the instruction. Most of them just say, drink one cup a day. But uh, some, some pe people drink more than three, four, five. That's what I want to know about that. Thank you very much. And for that note, that all the energy drinks are telling you to drink half a bottle only. That's what they're telling you. But people are drinking six, eight. So I think it is important that people need to check. So it's behavioral change, Neymar. Can you respond to that? So um, that example was from the uh, case that we received. Now it's only one case. And uh, still I'll emphasize on behavioral changes, but it's hard to recommend changes in policies concerning energy drink because we don't have enough data. This was the only case that we had and it was uh, like last two months. Even though it was trending, but it's only one case. So you cannot say from the case that we have received, we need to change policies. But later, this could be a call for us to make um, a study and do uh, collect more data. Then when we see that this is a trend for young people to have myocardial infarction as a, re as a result of uh, energy drink, then yes, we can say something about it. But for now, we cannot say anything because it was only one patient. I don't know if I have answered your question. Uh, Asante Nema, I like her comment. Of course, she's saying that if you see a snake is bitten one person, that won't be a problem. Do a study C to see how many people will be bitten by snake before you take action. So uh, that's an interesting perspective. But I do believe that if one case has been noted to have this problem, maybe it is high time now we think about it. And it because the question is, are people consuming the right recommended amount? You know, are the people that are producing them giving this uh, information? Because if you look at the, the, the caution note, it's, it's in very, very small scripts, you know. You can't really read it, you know. I, I thought maybe that's where we should uh, see that are we really addressing people that they use it uh, safely. So may I take this time to thank the audience. You have been a wonderful audience for staying here and making sure that we do this session successfully. And may I kindly ask you to put your hands together for all these presenters, including those ones that, that are online. We have, I see Stephanie and, and James online. Thank you guys for all the presentations. So please your hands together for these presenters. Asante Nisana, and I, I think we, it's time for the next sessions that is going to be here, which is also on non-communicable diseases. Karibu Nisana for those who are staying around and now now enter Semningine. Thank you, guys. So just to let you know, the second session that is going to be in this hall is on disparities, risk factors, and determinants of uh, health and for NCD. And the chair, I think, is here. Karibu, <laughs> Chief. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we're going to go straight to our next session on disparities, risk factors, and determinants of health for NCDs. Um, if you have an updated uh, schedule, you will see that the chair has changed from Professor Gastro 
to me. I'm Dr. Ali Said. I'm an uh, obstetrician from Muhas. So let's have our next presenters to come in front. Shehu Buhari. Uh, Shehu Buhari, I'm told, is online. May Idris Kikula. Um, Primus Ewald. Primus. Please also come in front. Uh, Eliana Jessica Kis Kisaka. Eliana, are you the one who just raised your hand? Eliana, please come in front. She's not around. And we have Bello Arkila is also presenting virtually. William Mwakasalas. Mwakalasia, please join us in front. So we are going to start with Shehu Buhari. We have 12 minutes for each presentation, and Shehu, I'm told, is online, isn't it? Yes. Shehu Buhari, Uko online. Hello. Can you yes. say something Hello. so that we know that yeah, you're good. here? Hello. Good morning. Good morning, all. Good morning, Chairman. Good. Thank you. So, are you going to present or should we play your pre recorded presentation? I'm going to present. Okay. So, you yes. will be able to share your screen and uh, start your presentation. Okay. Please, please share your screen and start your presentation. You have 12 minutes for uh, presenting. Thank you. Yeah. Can you see my screen? Not yet, but um, Not I yet. think maybe it's coming. Now it is coming. Yeah. Good. Can you also put a um, full screen, please, slideshow? Okay. Now you're okay. You can start your presentation now. We have 12 minutes and it's exactly 11.30. Thank you. Hello, good morning. Good morning, Chairman. Good morning, all. Uh, the topic of my presentation is prevalence and determinants of non-communicable diseases among healthcare workers in six public hospitals in Sokoto State, Northwestern Nigeria. My other co-presenters or my other co-researchers are Dr. Bello Magaji Arkila and Professor Ahmed Mohammed Hussein. Um, non-communicable diseases are diseases that are not transmittable from one person to another, such as cardiovascular diseases. Respir chronic respiratory diseases, cancers, diabetes. Uh, these diseases are responsible for, they are responsible for 75% of all deaths globally, and they force a major public health challenge. Some of the risk factors of the uh, non-communicable disease are modifiable, such as physical inactivity, unhealthy diet, consumption of alcohol and tobacco smoking. 
while other risk factors are modifiable, sorry, uh, are not modifiable, such as age, genetics, and ethnicity. Uh, healthcare workers are personnel who are engaged in actions within community with a primary intent of enhancing health. Unfortunately, their health condition is often neglected, and data on their pre the prevalence of non-communicable disease among this category of workers uh, is limited. This paper described the finding of a cross-sectional study conducted in Sokoto in, uh, between uh, April and July of 2023 among 315 healthcare workers in Sokoto State, Nigeria. The aim is to assess the prevalence of hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and dyslipidemia among this group of health workers. The paper also discusses the implication of the finding for prevention and control of NCDs among healthcare workers and the general population. The uh, methods. The study is a cross-sectional study. Participants who are healthcare workers. Um, area of study is Sokoto State, Northwestern Nigeria. Sample size was 305. Uh, this was arrived using the Slobian's formula, where the minimum sample size was calculated to be 301, but we added 10% to make sure uh, to make provision for uh, any participant that may wish to withdraw during the course of the research. Uh, data collection, we use the modified WHO stepwise questionnaire. And the first step of the questionnaire, demogra social demographic information were collected. The second information involved the physical measurement, where the height, weight, uh, hip circumference, and waist circumference were measured, as well as uh, blood pressure. This was followed by, by the third stage, which is the biochemical measurement. Here we measure uh, blood sample for fasting blood glucose and lipid profiles. Uh, they include total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol, and triglycerides. This study obtained ethical clearance from the State Ministry of Health and from the Specialist Hospital. Now, analysis of the data. Univariate and multivariate logistic regression was used for the analysis to, to, to uh, compare uh, to major relationship. P-value was set at equal to or less than 0 0.05, considered statistically significant. Mean standard deviation were used where appropriate, and all uh, estimate of prediction were presented at 95% uh, confidence uh, in town. Demographics, a total of uh, 315 participants participated in the study. Male-female ratio was 1 to 1.4. Mean age was 35.5, marital status 222 or 70.5%. Majority of the cadre of the professional that participated were nurses, 209 or 66.3%. Uh, prevalence of uh, raised blood pressure was uh, found to be 14.9% or 47 uh, participants. Average systolic and diastolic blood pressure readings were 124.7 plus minus 19.8 and 85.3 plus minus 10.9. Mean fasting blood glucose level was 5.89 plus minus 1.96. Current smokers were 1% or three participants. Those that use smokeless tobacco were 0.3% or uh, one participant. Current alcohol users were 10 or 3.2%. Those that frequently add salt to their meals were 40 or 12.7%. Physically inactive participants were 181 or 57.5%. The fruit and vegetable consumption was uh, inadequate based on the WHO recommendation of uh, uh, 40, more than 40 grams of fruit and vegetables per day. Uh, in summary, the most frequent non communicable diseases found in this study were hypertension, 41%, diabetes, 8.3%. This lipidemia, 3.8%, and those with family history, 17%. Females have higher hypertension uh, than males. There is no gender difference in other non communicable diseases. Sorry. Um, our study provided evidence of high prevalence of non communicable disease and their determinants. Age, sex, body mass index, alcohol consumption, and family history were key determinants of the selected NCDs. There is need actually to strengthen the health system and the health, from, uh, health promotion activities to improve surveillance, treatment, as well as control. 
uh, limitations. We relied on previously diagnosed reported non-communicable disease, which might introduce a recall bias. Diabetes was diagnosed by capillary blood glucose measurement and not by oral glucose tolerance test. This might uh, uh, overestimate or underestimate the real prevalence of diabetes among the study population. Uh, another limitation is cause. This has limited the inclusion of other non-communicable diseases, such as chronic kidney disease, chronic respiratory disease, asthma, cardiovascular disease, cancer, etc. Given the rising risk, uh, rising risk factors for non-communicable diseases, there is a need for further research to investigate how to improve behavioral adherence to lessen the burden of non-communicable disease, diseases among healthcare workers in Sokoto. Uh, the, uh, the strength of the study, uh, it is one of the few studies that examine the burden of key non-communicable disease among healthcare workers in Sokoto State. Participants included in the study were drawn from different health professional groupings, and this has positive implication for the diversity of the data collected and the generalizability of the study findings. Uh, we wish to acknowledge the support and the cooperation of the manager of the six public hospitals that participated in this study. The six research assistants, two nurses, and four medical laboratory scientists. We wish to acknowledge them and the entire 315 healthcare workers that volunteered to participate in this study. Uh, thank you very much. I have my references. Uh, attach. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shehu Buhari, all the way from yeah. Nigeria. And uh, yeah. thank you for a very good presentation on health workers' um, um, prevalence of non communicable diseases. So let's go to our next present presenter. That is May. Yes, welcome. Please, uh, share who stay online uh, for the discussion okay. at the end of all the presentation. Thank you. Okay, okay. Please unshare your screen. Okay. Again, by the camera. Sorry. Good morning. Uh, my name is May Kikula. I'm a pediatrician from Buganda Medical Center, and I would like to welcome you all to my presentation entitled Clinical Patterns and Factors Associated with Outcome Among Premature Neonates Who Were Admitted to Buganda Medical Center in Mwanza, Tanzania. So globally, 15 uh, million preterm are born each year, and Africa accounts for 31% of these preterm births. Preterm neonates are a vulnerable population with an increased uh, risk for medical complications which necessitate uh, them to have prolonged hospital stay. Uh, prematurity is associated with increased morbidity and mortality and is the second leading cause of under five mortality, especially in the first, days, the first seven days of life. Uh, prematurity is a significant uh, global health concern associated with complications. Uh, clinical patterns including respiratory distress syndrome, hypoglycemia, hypothermia, among others, have been, uh, can cause poor outcome in these babies. At Bugano Medical Center, prematurity is the leading cause of admission, accounting for 53% of all pediatric admissions and 55% of all neonatal deaths. Neonatal sepsis as one of the causes of mortality has been extensively studied for the past decade at our facility with a prevalence ranging between 39 and 21 percent. Mortality in these neonates has been increasing over the years from 19 percent to up to around about 50 percent. Mortality caused by neonatal sepsis in the world has been well documented, but there is no concrete information on contribution of other clinical patterns. Uh, this study aimed, 
to identify and in the documentation of common clinical patterns and their association to mortality in our words, data on association of clinical patterns to outcome will help on understanding of patients at higher risk for prompt and timely management. So this was a study that was done at Buganda Medical Center. It was a prospective longitudinal study conducted from February to June of 2023, where we enrolled a premature neonates who were less than three days of life, who were admitted at our study, uh, at our, sorry, at our neonatal units. We did follow for each enrolled uh, participants uh, daily at a fixed interval of eight hours, where the clinical patterns of interest were assessed and outcome of interest up until the seventh day of life for each participant who was enrolled. So these were the independent variables that were of interest, which included respiratory distress syndrome, necrotizing enterocolitis, congenital anomalies, clinical neonatal jaundice, hypothemia, and hypoglycemia. And our dependent variables include uh, early neonatal death, is the death that occurs within the first seven days of life, and hospital stay of more than seven days. Analysis, uh, we used generalized linear model uh, which used to determine the predictors of mortality and hospital stay of more than seven days. Relative risk with a 95% confidence evil interval was calculated to measure the strength of association between predictive variables and outcome. Uh, predictors with a p-value of less than 0.05 after calculating for adjusted relative risk were considered as significant independent uh, predictors of outcome. So. From there, we get to see the patterns in the table. On the right side, we get to see the patterns that were observed throughout our study time, where clinical neonatal jaundice was the leading, where about uh, 200 patients developed uh, jaundice during the hospital stay. This was followed by respiratory distress syndrome and hypothermia. The rest are the other clinical patterns that occur at a relatively uh, lower number compared to the three above. And on the left side, we get to see a vein diagram showing overlapping of the three common clinical patterns that was observed during our study time. So mortality that was um, observed was 18%, and 45.1% uh, of those patients were uh, required hospital stay more than seven days, and the remaining 364 were discharged within the first seven days of life. Uh, on the part of mortality, we get to see that 41% uh, of those patients who died, or the death occurred within the first three days of life, and the remaining of about 60 occurred about, uh, after the first three days of life. Uh, this uh, finding was interesting as compared to previous studies that have been done, which have showed that majority of neonatal death occur within the first three days of life. On our kaplan meier survival curve, uh, we get to see that uh, the probability of survival of these patients dropped by 25%, reaching 75% on the seventh day of life. On the part of discussion, the clinical patterns that were observed, the occurrence were similar to many other studies that have been done locally and internationally. Of uh, interest was our mortality that has significantly reduced compared to uh, past studies that have been done, and this ha can be attributed to the major innovations that have been done at our facility, uh, including increasing number of uh, bed capacity, both in our general neonatal units together with our intensive neonatal units. Uh, several uh, campaigns that were uh, emphasized at our, uh, at our institution, Inter intensification of ICP program, uh, adherence of the recommendation that are set by WHO in combating of the uh, death that occurs in uh, preterm society. And together, uh, increment of staff in our neonatal units, including pediatricians and also neonatologists. The factors associated with mortality were more or less similar to several other studies that have been done. And hospital stay of more than seven days was significantly observed in patients who had gastrochesis, and this can be uh, explained by the modality of treatment that we employ at our facility. That involves the use of uh, silobat, 
with a serial reduction of extravasated ab abdominal bowels, uh, which takes a prolonged period of time. Furthermore, at the time this patient uh, finished with the gastrochesis care, majority of them develop malnutrition due to the small feeds that are given that can tolerate during the silent bag treatment. Together with uh, patients with uh, clinical neonatal jaundice and necrotizing enterocolitis. From our study, uh, we recommended to strengthen and sustain a, a surfactant therapy to premature neonates who had respiratory distress syndrome. Since during the time of data collection, uh, due to several reasons, surfactant therapy was not available at our neonatal units. Uh, further strengthening of, preven of prevention and control of hypothemia in our neonatal world as hypothemia has been uh, documented by several past literatures that it is very fatal for these uh, premature neonates. Furthermore, emphasis of referral hospitals on early and proper care of newborns with gastrochesis, as we observed that many patients who were admitted were, uh, were admitted uh, with uh, gangrenous uh, bowels, which itself is a poor prognostic factor. Furthermore, most patients are referred having severe electorate derangement and dehydration. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, May Kikula, for talking about premature babies, uh, causes of admission and deaths. Um, our next presenter is Primus Ewald. And also thank you, May, for keeping time. Thank you. Yes, Primus. Good morning. Uh, I'll be presenting about the clinical characteristics and treatment outcome of childhood acute lymphobastic leukemia in Tanzania. Uh, the study was done from 2016 to 2020. Uh, childhood acute, acute, acute lymphobastic leukemia is the most common cancer among children. The survival rate of uh, childhood, childhood, childhood ALL has improved significantly in the past 10 years, uh, past 50 years. Uh, in the first world countries, uh, moving from 10% in the 1960s to over 90% in recent years in high income countries. A wide gap exists uh, in the survival outcome of childhood ALL between low and, low and middle income countries. Uh, with the high income cu countries. The initial, initial outcome of childhood cancer, of childhood uh, ALL uh, at Ocean Road in 2010, 2008 and 2010, showed median event free survival of about 12.4 and two years uh, event free survival of 33% respectively. Since then, uh, the pediatric oncology service in Tanzania has improved trem trem tremendously. Uh, and the research, this research aimed at uh, the current clinical outcome of childhood uh, acute lymphobastic leukemia at Mumbil National Hospital from 2016 to 2020. The method used was a retrospective cohort study on pediatric patients. Uh, the pa all patients would initiate treatment on the 1st of January 2016 to the 31st of 2020 December. We obtain information from patients' demographics, uh, disease presentation from their charts, and also we had to call to phone the parent, the patient's family. It's mated uh, overall survival and event-free survival from the date of the treatment initiating using Kaplan-Meier method. Calculated, we also calculated the hazard ratios of survival using unvariable and multivariable Cox proportional hazard methods. So this is the flow chart from admission to study enrollment. The children who were admitted uh, to pediatric oncology department at MNH suspicious of uh, ALL were about 318. Uh, among the 318, uh, 42 died before the confirmation of ALL. Uh, five of them died before initiation of the treatment. Uh, 
among the LL, uh, those who received medications before admission at MNH were 53, and files which were lost were 13, and diagnosed with LL prior to one year of age were three. So ch ch children with confirmatory diagnosis of LL who were eligible for the analysis were 202. Uh, the demographic and clinical characteristics of patients, uh, uh, so the number that was variable, 202, females were 84, which was 41.6%. For age, the median range, uh, we, could also, we could assess 200 of them. Patients from 12 to, 12 to 13 months were 12. Patients to, from 2 to 9 years, 122. And above 10 years, we are 66. Uh, according to diagnosis, B lineage were 140, and T lineage was 61. Comorbidities were patients with sickle cell anemia uh, were 15, uh, with Down syndrome were 7, and HIV was only 1. Uh, present a demographic and clinical characteristics presentation of symptoms. Lymphadenopathy, uh, we could only assess 201. 164 had lymphadenopathy. 127 had splenomegaly, and 109 had hepatomegaly, with 52 had edema. Uh, the median range for uh, white blood cell count of 11,500. Uh, hemoglobin was a 6.4. Platelets of 32.1. LDH, uh, 995. Uric acid of 0 0.36, and creatinine of 45.5. Uh, testicular involvement among the 110 male was 13. Uh, CNS involvement was 30. Uh, NIC risk classification standard was 105 and high risk was 96. The air rapid response, uh, those could be evaluated with 107. Uh, so 43 had the air rapid response and those who have achieved remission after induction were 126 among 194. Remission achieved in the Maradi negative 100, 100, among 126 were 96, and remission achieved but MRD was positive were 9. Uh, infections complications during chemotherapy was fibra neutropenia, 85 had fibra neutropenia, 37 had malaria, uh, 22 had sepsis. Varicella zoster, we had 14 patients. Uh, those with parasites, only one patient. Non-infectious complications, cerebrovascular hemorrhage, nine, and nine also had gastrointestinal bleeding, tumalysis syndrome, six, and osteonecrosis were four of fractures. The clinical outcome for relapse, we could assess 126, 33 had relapse. Uh, those relapse CNS uh, were 17, Treatment abandonment among the 202 were 28. Uh, and overall outcome, remission after treatment, 45. Currently on treatment, these were the ones who were still on treatment when we were doing the, the study, were 20. Uh, death was 115. Uh, progressive disease, 74 among the 115. Toxicity, uh, that death that was due to progressive disease was 74. Uh, death that was due to toxicity was 24. Absconded uh, death was 7, and unknown death were 10. Hormone palliation were 20, and unknown were 2. Death before uh, or during remission induction, among 198, were 52. So factors related to pre- and post-hospital delays. Pre-hospital factors. Uh, any treatment administered at previous hospitals before arriving at Mohimbili National Hospital, uh, we assessed 173, so 144 had received treatment. Those who had received blood transfusion were 99, antibiotics 78, anti-TB medications were 18, anti-malaria were 6. Uh, days from symptoms onset to the first hospital uh, arrival, among 134, 30. 30 was the uh, median that there were delays. And days from symptom onset to arriving to MNH was about 60 days. Patients living within two hours from home to Mwimbili National Hospital were 62.
Uh, Post-hospital factors, days from admission to diagnosis uh, is uh, average of seven. Uh, diagnostic delays uh, among 182 were 84 days. Reason for diagnostic delay, uh, initial admitted to, the to, the wrong, to, the, to another ward, 37 patients, awaiting for flow cytometry results, 33. Awaiting histopathology results, it's 10. Peripheral blood revealed, no abnormality, 10. And wrong initial diagnosis was nine. Uh, days from diagnosis to treatment was zero. And days from admission to treatment uh, average was six. Treatment initiated before confirmed diagnosis, 53 patients had been initiated on treatment before diagnosis. So this is the chart for uh, the graph of overall, event, overall survival and event-free survival, which shows about 300 and, uh, 303 days of event-free survivals, which is about 38% for two years, and median overall survival of 530 uh, for two years, which is about 45%. So discussion, 15% um, of patients, uh, that is 47 patients among the 318, who were suspected to acute leukemia died before diagnosis or treatment. 26% uh, of patients who achieved bone marrow remission relapsed. 14% of patients abandoned treatment. Sickling text and edema showed uh, also to be significant. Uh, strengthening of health services and system may improve timely arrival or diagnosis of patients. Adequate, in, adequate intensity of treatment accompanied by good supportive therapy and that patient follow-up may reduce relapse and treatment aban abandonment. Sickle cell and edema may be, may be leukemic prognostic factors among this cohort. Thank you. Thank you, Primus, for this good presentation on acute leukemia in children. Now we go to our next presentation, um, Eliana Jess, who I think was not here in the beginning. Eliana Jess, are you in the, uh, in the audience, among the audience? No, she's not here. Is she recording? Okay, so let's go to the next one. Um, Bello, who is online? Bello Akila. Bello is also not in the crowd or online. So we'll go to William. William? Is a full screen. Okay. William. Uh, good afternoon. I am William Nelson. Screen.
I'll be presenting on a, uh, a research uh, report that uh, ti is titled uh, Self-Reported uh, Pesticide Exposure During Pregnancy Among Small-Scale Horticulture Workers in Tanzania. This is a descriptive cross-sectional study which is part of a big uh, PhD project, ongoing PhD project, and this is just one of the work in progress. Uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, we have a very big number of women working in agriculture, and it is currently estimated to be around 80% of uh, actively uh, active women. Uh, and in Tanzania, around 70% of women are engaged in horticulture farming, which is uh, one of the sectors which inv uh, is associated with the massive use of agrochemicals in the country, and particularly pesticides. So what happens when uh, these pesticides are handled or are in contact with the pregnant women, uh, some of the pesticides bears uh, reproductive toxicity. That means they are able to cross the maternal child, maternal fetal placenta barrier to reach the, uh, the fetus. That means the fetus will be exposed to pesticides in uh, very early stages of life. Ultimately, later, these effects might be associated with some um, uh, uh, pregnancy, uh, adverse pregnancy outcomes, or these children are prone to developing NCDs in their later stages of life. So in our, in our setting, traditionally, women are not excluded from agriculture activities. We have a number of studies reporting uh, a magnitude, I mean, a significant values in terms of levels of pesticides detected in maternal biological uh, samples, such as blood, urine, and, and, and the others. But it have never been reported how are these uh, pesticides reaching these mothers? Are they, uh, the, are, are they part of the pesticide that they were exposed to before pregnancy? or is something that happened uh, during pregnancy. So this is study aimed to, uh, to, to, uh, to determine whether are these exposures happening in, uh, in real pregnancy duration or uh, in areas that uh, stages of, 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 of life. So it is, uh, as I said, it's a cross-sectional study which was done in three uh, regions and in each region one district was selected, and in each district, two wards were involved. A focus were mothers raising a, a child aged four to six years, and uh, this uh, age was uh, strategically uh, selected because, as I said, it's, uh, this is just a part of the big uh, PhD project, uh, which involves some uh, neural development and the behavioral aspects of the children at this age. And uh, this pair of mother and child must have been living together since uh, delivery. And uh, we did the historical collection of exposure uh, data using uh, a questionnaire which was done to a mother. So what we found, uh, first of all, we managed to reach uh, 432 women, as I said, in the three districts, and we mean age of 33.8 years, and the majority were of mid-adulthood of 31 to 40 years. And uh, most women were working in farms which were around a kilometer away from home. That means the whole environment where these children will be growing up is contaminated with pesticides. And uh, the first question we were to confirm were these women actually engaged in horticulture work during pregnancy. As you can see, 
86% of them were working in horticulture work, in horticulture farms. And uh, of interest were, when you realized you were pregnant, did you decide to stop uh, uh, dealing with horticulture? And when you decided to stop, when did you decide to do so? As you can see in this uh, part below, it is almost equally distributed from the first trimester to the third trimester. But majority, as you can see, 47% decided to stop when pregnancy was at the third trimester. That means when they felt like they are tired. It's not because they were excluding themselves from exposures. <laughs> and uh, we, we asked them, uh, which we know uh, some of the activities which are in, in, uh, engage more of the contact with species compared to others. So we asked these women which of the active uh, of the known pesticides related activities did you engage with when you were pregnant? As you can see, uh, seventy five percent of women were sometimes spraying, directly engaged in spraying pesticides during pregnancy. And uh, more than 50% were doing weeding. This weeding is the most practiced by women and because uh, they assume it is easy and uh, safe. But sometimes women don't enter into the sprayed farm which was sprayed with the pesticides within 24 hours. It's prohibited. Most of the pesticides are, they are labeled so. You should go back in the farm at least seven days later. So it, uh, we found more than 50% pregnant women going back to the uh, horticulture farm within 24 hours for either weeding, and you can see some of them around 20% we are going for harvest. And uh, majority, as you can see, about more than 50% were engaged in uh, washing clothes of which their husbands maybe were using uh, for spraying. And uh, surprisingly, uh, you can see uh, almost 40% of women reported to eating. You are working in a horticulture farm and you find a very ripe uh, tomato and they pick it and eat, which was sprayed with the pesticides within 24 hours. So all these practices exposes women to toxic chemicals uh, while they are having an, uh, a fetus in their body. So with regard to gestational age, as to when did you engage in such hazardous activity, you can see uh, in the first trimester and the second trimester, most women are still strong. Uh, and you can see a lot are still dealing with these hazardous uh, encounters. Uh, take a look at the weeding. You can see 50% uh, within the first assignment of the trimester, they were still weeding. 50% within the second trimester, they're still weeding. These are some of the uh, hazardous uh, activities. And uh, to conclude, the ILO, uh, recognizes agriculture as the most, uh, as the occupation, one of the most dangerous occupation. They say uh, it's after mining. Imagine after mining, the second most dangerous occupation is agriculture. And in our setting, pregnant women are engaged in such dangerous activity. And uh, in recognizing that the ILO have a convention of which it states that it's a call. Measures shall be taken to ensure that the special needs of women, ag women agriculture workers are taken into account in relation to pregnancy, breastfeeding, and reproductive health. However, as of this year, it's only 21 countries have ratified to this convention. That means countries are hesitating to engage into these 
agreement because they feel that they can't afford to do it. So we are exposing dangerous future generation to hazardous chemicals without taking serious efforts to that. So therefore, this study is like a wake up call for all responsible parties in the country to spearhead policy dialogues in line with the Alaw Convention number 184 of 2001. In doing so, maybe we might reduce a uh, number of these hazardous chemicals that women tended to get encounter with during pregnancy. Thank you very much. Thank you, William. Oh, yes. This uh, very nice research on pregnant women and pesticide exposures. We still have two more presentations that we were supposed to have, but the presenters were not here. Um, if any of the presenters has showed up, you can come straight in front. Bello Akila Magaji and Eliana Jesse Kisaka. If any of you is here, you can come uh, uh, for your presentation. I don't see any response, so let's go straight to the discussion. Um, let's have uh, the first round of questions to our presenters. Please uh, direct your questions to the specific presenter. Questions, comments, yes? Uh, so thank you for a nice presentation. My question goes to Primus Edward on clinical electrolysis and treatment uh, outcome of children with ALL. So you uh, explained about the uh, pre-hospital factors for the hospital delay among these patients with ALL. Uh, a little bit of experience at Mwanza, majority of patients who are uh, with cancer delay treatment due to, first they go to the uh, uh, traditional healers before coming to the hospital. So there is this um, pattern of uh, going to the uh, dispensary, traditional healer, healer, health center, then traditional healer, so this may cause delay of this patient to come to the hospital. Uh, I was asking, did you look into that's uh, that uh, this patient also uh, go to the traditional healers before coming to the hospital setting and it might be a factor that may cause that uh, pre-hospital delay among this patient with ALL. Thank you, Primus, you just wait, just wait. Yes. Thank you very much. And my question also go to Primus, uh, who presented about acute lymphocytic leukemia. In his presentation, and you 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 uh, indicated that you were able to uh, call to have a call to have a I don't know. It's like how you, you reached the family to get some of the information. And then in your results, you told us that about 14% uh, uh, lost it follow up uh, in your study. So I was interested uh, to know what were the causes that are being associated with loss to follow up that contributed to this 14%. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you again. My question, I have three questions all directed to Dr. Primus. Uh, in your presentation, you showed us uh, your, the demographic characteristics of your study concerning the participants, but I was curious to know, 
did you manage to know the region or the places where majority of these patients came from? Because it can determine the exposures and uh, affect directly the outcome of our study. The other question was the recommend. Oh. We didn't see the recommendation, but as the previous colleague said, we should improve our primary health cares to facilitate air detection, air screening detection, and the management. Hence, will it will assist in reducing the percentage of the burden of delay to the to seek the management. But also, the other question was, you, in your presentation, you said there are percent of patients, I don't remember well, about 10 to 20, who abandoned their treatment. Did we look what made them to abandon their, pre their treatment? Because this really, really affects the outcome and the, and the well-being of these children. Thank you. Yes, here in front here, there's. Thank you. I have a question to share who Buhari. I wish to know on while he was uh, searching on the determinants of NCD among the healthcare workers, were he able to categorize the healthcare workers into different cadres? And uh, in order to know exactly um, the prevalence and the determinants of the NCD among the healthcare workers. Thank you. Uh, my question goes to Dr. May Riskula. Uh, we saw one of the leading causes of neonatal admission was uh, neonatal jaundice. And again, uh, but among the causes of death, Neonatal jaundice was there. So, and since we know that neonatal jaundice can be uh, one of the signs and, sign and symptoms for a predisposing condition, may I ask, uh, were there any studies done to show or elaborate the main causes of neonatal jaundice in this case? Thank you. My question goes to the first presenter, the visual presenter. You highlighted, you highlighted um, the limitations, like three or four limitations, something that might deduce the credibility of the results. So I just want to know how did you deduce or mitigate the limitations? This question goes to who, sorry? The first presenter. The first presenter. Okay, let's have the, some responses first, and then we can have more questions. Um, I will start with uh, Primus. You have uh, um, a lot of questions, so please. Thank you for your questions. Uh, I'll start addressing the first question. Tradition, if traditional healers we checked on that. We did try checking on the traditional healers, if patients presented tra traditional healers centers to see if it was significant. But the data that we have, we had, was not significant for us to evaluate that part. Because first of all, the patients were from 2016 to 2020. So most of them were not, uh, we could not see, see them physically. So the, most of the data we were getting were from the charts, the hospital charts. So you would call them and you ask them. If they can't tell you, some of them would not tell you because maybe they were brought to the uh, hospital by the, pa the mother, by now they're living with the grandmother or uh, vice versa. So it was checked, but it was not significant for us to evaluate it and uh, present it. Uh, and on the uh, recommendations and discussion, 14% of the patients were lost on follow-up. So, uh, we are to TLM, to Mind Lamaisha. What we are doing is uh, we are trying to establish centers for uh, childhood cancer like, uh, with hospitals, to work in collaboration with hospitals to be able to help the whole country. So most of the causes that we have seen uh, that lead to uh, lost on follow-up, the major one is distance from the hospital. So uh, 
acute lymphoblastic leukemic patients have to, to be on follow-up for more than two years. So every month they would be going back to the hospital. They have to check to have weekly full blood pictures for follow-up and to be able to use their medications for maintenance. So if they are living far from the hospital, they tend to abscond. Also the cost of, uh, of this follow-up, like uh, traveling costs, uh, cost for full blood pictures, also causes for them to abscond and loss on follow-up. Uh, on the question of the region where most of these patients are coming from, our research was based more on at patients who attended uh, Moimbili National Hospital. So most of the patients were coming from Dar es Salaam. Uh, but that this does not mean it's, uh, it's conclusive because we did not analyze the whole country. There are still patients who are being seen at Bugando. There are patients who are seen at uh, KSMC. There are patients who are seen at Benjamin Mkapa. So this just uh, goes entangles patients who are seeing only at Muimbil National Hospital. But among the patients that we saw, most of them are coming from Dar es Salaam. I hope I've answered the question. Thank you. Yeah, um, I hope uh, uh, those who uh, had questions, you're satisfied with the response. Let's go online to Shehu. Can you hear us? You had two questions, yeah. Shehu. Can you please yeah. uh, respond to your questions? Yeah, the, hello. The first question is uh, on whether I categorize the, the patient, I mean the respondent uh, by KEDA. Yes, I did. Uh, actually, you, uh, I mentioned that we have 209 of the participants to be nurses. That is 63%. And then we have the medical laboratory scientists to be 64, which is 20.3. And then we have the pharmacists to be 10, 3.2. And we have the doctors to be 15, which is 4.8. Of course, we categorize them. And uh, you will agree with me uh, in the analysis. The more you have the sample size, the more uh, result would be, uh, uh, I mean, uh, uh, significant because when you have poor sample size, you know, the statistical treatment will, will not give you an, a, 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 a result that satisfies all the requirements. Now, on the second issue of uh, limitations, yes, uh, if you look at the WHO NCD questionnaires, questions are asked to the participant on whether they were diagnosed with hypertension before or diabetes. So we have to rely on the, the response they give. Uh, and I said on the issue of diagnosis, we said that uh, there could be underestimated or, or overestimation of those that are diabetic because we just use capillary blood uh, sample after 18 to 20, uh, sorry, 15 to 20 hours of fasting. The ideal and WHO recommendation is that we should do the test twice consecutively or where indicated where we have an indeterminate result, we should do an oral glucose tolerance test. And I talk on the issue of cost. We didn't include, you know, uh, because of the limitation of cost, we couldn't do for uh, chronic kidney diseases, asthma, and uh, we, we could not include uh, ca uh, cardiovascular diseases. Actually, looking at the sample size and uh, this work is part of a phd work we cannot actually include and still be able to conclude the work within the period slated uh, for the phd research i hope i've answered your question thank you thank you very much Shea, for those responses yes uh, we have a question for may Uh, thank you, Dr. S, uh, for your question. So many studies have done on pertaining on the causes of neonatal jaundice. Uh, some have stated uh, due to the decrease or intake of um, this premature neonate, as they can only tolerate a small amount of seeds, which is increased gradually. It brings about increased enteropathic circulation and in turn causes jaundice for these patients. Furthermore, immaturity of the liver uh, bringing about failure to metabolize bilirubin causes about bilirubin. Uh, top of that, uh, lifespan of RBC 
uh, in neonate is smaller as compared to general population. It's furthermore uh, reduced in uh, premature neonates due to their physiological uh, components. Um, so it also facilitates uh, derubing such uh, population. But this cannot be a justification for a patient as we only included those patients who are less than three days of life. Thank you. Thank you. So um, if you are not satisfied with the responses, you can have a follow-up questions. Yes, we are taking more questions. Um, I see we still have time. Any more questions? Yes, please direct to a specific presenter. Hello. Hello. Uh, thank you for all the presenters. My question is directed to William Mwakalasia. Well, you attempted an important study, but I wanted to put a few remarks for improvement. Self-reporting, we all do this, but is mostly too subjective. So when you undertake such a study, you need to find ways of including objective verifiable indicators. So in this study, I would have appreciated, in addition to self-reporting, if you would have gone further and assess pesticide levels circulating in the pregnant women. There are many ways of doing that. And tie that one with pregnancy outcome. When you do that, that study is more productive and more interesting. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Hello. Uh, yeah, my, my question, first of my question goes to the uh, doctor from Nigeria. Uh, his study was about health worker uh, to screen for NCD, and I was, I was interested to understand what was the main cause of, of those uh, health workers with hypertension. What was the main reason of those health workers having hypertension? And the second question goes to the doctor from Bugando with prematurity features. Uh, why didn't you consider the research about how you can prevent premature rather than features of prematurity? Yes. Any more questions for our presenters? Okay, maybe uh, the chair also has uh, an opportunity to ask questions to our presenters. Um, my first question will go to May, and um, you said that the, the, the mortality had decreased from previous uh, studies or situation, but how about the causes of these deaths uh, for this premature uh, death? Have they also changed? compared to what was there before. And also, um, you, you also talked about um, uh, how the improvement, I mean, recent improvement uh, contributed to the decrease in mortality. But also, um, I understand also there have been other uh, facilities that have been improved, and how has that contributed to this uh, with the re reduction of um, uh, referrals? Um, I have a question for um, William. Uh, were these women using any protective gears? Did you look into this when they are doing their um, horticulture activities? And have they ever been trained on how to use protective gears and were they really using? And did you 
observe or see any malformations from uh, on the children uh, since you included children that were six years um, and above and can you also uh, just to our understanding what kind of chemicals are found in these pesticides that they were using in these regions specific chemicals that uh, might affect pregnancy and and child development um, yes so these are my questions so if there are any, no more questions from the audience um, we can start with uh, the first presenter who was um, Shehu Shehu, you had one question? Yes. Yes. Hello, can you hear me? We can hear you. Yeah, uh, the question he asked was uh, on whether I have asked on the cause of hypertension in the healthcare workers. Is that right? Yes. Y yes. Uh, where the work is on the study of the prevalence of some selected non communicable diseases. Uh, we did not go into analysis of what is the cause, but these are people who are already, who are already health personnel, and if they are diagnosed, the questionnaire asks whether they themselves have, were diagnosed before as hypertensive or diabetics, or a family member, or any of the siblings. So the questionnaire did not require us to go as to find what is the cause of hypertension in these healthcare workers. But I can say that, you know, uh, pro, there is probability that uh, the, the type of work they conduct exposes them to occupational hazard. You know, this shifting uh, and other strenuous activities, and because uh, we don't have adequate number of uh, medical manpower, most of them are overworked. So all these stressors may, may actually predispose them to development of any of the NCDs, including uh hypertension thank you <clears throat> thank you shahu yeah. for those responses now let's go to william i think you have several questions thank you very much for very nice questions uh, with regard to an approach uh, on uh, doing the self-reported uh, assessment uh I have a colleague in, in the project who is, his, uh, her study is towards the direction you are suggesting. Uh, she's doing, she's measuring pesticide levels in, ma in women and she's assessing the pregnancy outcomes. So that is also taken care of, but in my direction is towards uh, uh, children's neurodevelopment. And uh, I'm assessing historical exposure because children are now four to six years old. And these reports I'm, uh, I'm presenting to you today, uh, they, I recall, there are a lot of bias on that, as you're saying, I, I agree with you. It's a recall of what happened when I was pregnant of a currently four years child. So there are a lot of challenges to that, I, I agree with you. Uh, questions from our chair. Uh, he asked whether these women were using any protective gears and where, were they trained on using them? Uh, actually, uh, pesticides handling and use is considered to be a man job. And uh, that's why in most training programs, women are not included. And uh, we had a qualitative study on that. A lot of women are crying to that, like uh, training programs comes, but uh, women are not part of the trainings. And uh, even those trained men are not using those gears as, as much as they required because they are supposed to buy themselves and these protective gears are expensive. So most avoid using them. Uh, with regard to malformations in children, uh, we did behavioral assessment and we also did uh, neurodevelopment assessment in children. A analysis of this data is ongoing. Uh, so I can't say anything on that as of now. We, don't, we didn't assess physical malformations. 
we just assess their, how these children behaved and their IQ. Uh, with regard to specific chemicals, currently in our country we have more than 1,000 registered chemicals uh, of different ingredients. Uh, I did, uh, and when I was designing the, the project, I did analysis of the existing chemicals uh, because I was interested with uh, chemicals which are neurotoxic, chemicals which can result into my expected outcomes. And they don't have to be only neurotoxic, but they also have to be to bear reproductive toxicity. That means uh, when a, a mother is exposed, these chemicals have the ability to cross the barrier, the placenta barrier, and reach a, a baby. And uh, from the list, I narrowed down to 12 chemicals. And these chemicals were the chemicals of interest. Uh, one part of the study involves analyzing, uh, knowing uh, whether these chemicals are actually available, uh, accessible to, to, to these horticulture women. And uh, the finding was all of them were available and were currently in use. So exposure to neurotoxic chemicals to uh, the fetus is obvious and is existing. Thank you. I would like to start with the first question. Why not consider um, how to prevent prematurity rather than what I did? So I wanted my, the problem that I uh, observed in our ward was majority of admission in our pediatric uh, unit were premature, premature new needs, about 53%. And out of them, those uh, prenatal uh, mortality was attributed by 55%. I was interested to know what are the clinical patterns that attribute to these patients dying having high mortality. Furthermore, I wanted to assess if the uh, interventions that have been, do, have been done at our center oh, for over a decade combating uh, neonatal mortality, are they uh, yielding any positive impact towards reduction of this significant high number? Uh, <clears throat> another question was, have the causes uh, changed? The patterns, have the patterns changed uh, during the time since the past studies that have been done and currently? Well, they're more or less the same, but the conditions that uh, uh, many, uh, many campaigns that are done, emphasis are done, uh, to come to Bugando Medical Center for super specialized surgical care and super specialized neonatal care, uh, those are the ones that we see that increment of um, increment of the numbers as compared to past studies over the years. And the increment of facilities has greatly reduced uh, the number of um, general, the general neonatal cases, but the ones that require super, uh, super specialized care are still admitted at our center. Thank you. Thank you to our uh, presenters for very nice responses. Uh, we still have time. If there are any more comments or questions, um, we're taking them. Yo, so um, if there are no more questions, then we will come to the end of this session. And I see that the audience has no more questions. So let's keep, let's thank our presenter from uh, Nigeria, uh, Shehu Buhari, and uh, presenters uh, at the audience here, May, William, and Primus, for a very nice presentation. Let's give them a round of applause. And this, uh, this will come to the end of this session and um, we'll welcome you to the next session. So maybe you have another 
few more minutes for rest, maybe 15, 20 minutes before you join our next session. Thank you very much, uh, presenters. Thank you, Mr. Shehu online also. Thank you very much. Thank you.